Our scripture today is taken from the New Testament, Luke 24, verses 13 to 31, and your pew Bible page is 84, 85. Please share this with me. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said and all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. It is again my joy to share the word this morning. The story of the walk to Emmaus is probably one of the famous story post Jesus' resurrection. And to be honest, it's kind of a hard story to preach on because most of the time people know the story. So whenever we hear the scripture, uh, people can already anticipate how the story started, what happened and how it's handed. And um, I hope you won't do that. Most of the times, like 99% of the sermon I've heard on this story um, usually focus on the disciple not recognizing Jesus or the Lord's table, the communion that happened at the end, which a great story and great lesson that we can learn from that. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different that sometimes we can miss when we read the story. Let me give the context of the story. We start from 13, so it 
kind of in the middle of the story. What happened is Jesus at this point is dead. It is on the third day and uh, some women, those who went to check him, they went and checked and see that he was not where they placed him. As the verse 13 starts, it says, now on the same day, two of them, which means two of the disciples, they decided to go from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now as they were walking, a stranger just joined them. And they were looking very sad. So it was appropriate for, them, for him to ask them, why are you sad? I love the way uh, Cleopas answered the, the, the question. Verse 18 talks about Cleopas. And for those who read the Bible, he, it, it is the name that comes in John. Um, among the stories of the women who were at the cross when Jesus was crucified, there is, there is a Mary who is said to be the wife of Cleopas. Now, in order to understand uh, the way Jesus functioned, uh, his leadership was kind of threefolded. He had an inner cycle of three people, uh, Peter, James, and John, of which we know a lot of stories that only those three, they were present. And then he had, I can call it a second belt of the 12 disciples. And then I believe that there was also another group of probably a lot of other disciples who were not part of the 12. When we read Luke in verse chapter 10, we can hear that Jesus sent 40, 70 of his followers on a mission. So I understand that Cleopas and his wife were not among the 12, were probably in this belt of uh, numerous disciples. And he had to be a very important or influential person for his story to make it to the gospel. What happened is, I, I like the answer that he gives in verse 18. He said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there these days? When I look at this, it looks like, let's see if you can remember. Let's say a few weeks ago, you run into somebody in a mall. You don't know what they are talking about, but all you could hear was, was that slap necessary or not necessary? Ah, okay. If you didn't get that joke, which means you, I don't know. You know, I understand that the death and crucifixion of Jesus was probably a big news that he was shocked that, are you the only one who was not aware? Just the same way when you talk about the slap and, you know, it's like when somebody say, I don't know, it's like, huh, do you watch the news or anything else? On verse 19, I love the way he replied to Jesus. He said, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, pay attention how he described Jesus, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word, not only before God, but before people. He's professing that Jesus was indeed a prophet. Now pay attention to verse 20. Now we say, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be crucified. That tells us that Cleopas was a Jew because the people who handed Jesus were the Jewish leaders. So now we're saying pretty much our leaders handed this mighty prophet of God to be crucified. Now verse 21 is my favorite verse and is going to be the the main point of my sermon here. Because in verse 21 now, it gives us the expectation that he had of Jesus. He said, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Regardless of how he was with Jesus, the hope that he had was like, this is the guy who is going to save us from the Romans. I can imagine that when he was seeing Jesus doing the miracle, he was like, yes, he's the man. When Jesus got arrested, he was like, you know, 
he's the man. He's the man. He's going to turn it around. When Jesus got, was brought to, 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 to the cross and died, I'm pretty sure he was like, you know, I've seen him raise dead people. He will resurrect and definitely he's going to save us from the Romans. Now you can hear, if you read verse 21, he says, <laughs> we had hope he was the one to redeem Israel. And yes, beside this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Now we realize that the Messiah and the Savior is dead for three days and the Romans are still ruling. The question that I want us to wrestle with it this morning is, what do you do when Jesus failed your expectations? Because it is clear that he had a certain expectation of what exactly Jesus was supposed to do. What do you do when you said, Jesus, I hope this is going to be done? And it turns out that either Jesus doesn't show up or when he show up, he doesn't even address what you had. Let us pray. Dear God, we bless your name. We pray that God, you help us to understand and navigate through this question. It is a question that God, we might not have it in our forehead or on a bumper stick on our car, but sometimes we wonder when you fail, when we feel like you failed us. And I hope that God, this story this morning can help us understand and how best we can understand this question and address this question. I pray that the Spirit of God be with us this morning and help the word to fit in the heart of each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't struggled with that question, me, I've struggled with it. There have been times that I've prayed for things and I hope Jesus will come through and it didn't work. Jesus, I hope that you, you know, we've been preached that you can heal, but I, I hope that I'll be healed by now. I hope that he is the one. I hope that she's the one, but look at what he or she has turned into. I thought that God, you, Jesus, they say you, you, you can restore, but I've been struggling with this over and over again. I, I I hope that you heal me, you fix me, you restore me. What I love about the story is how Jesus answered the question, and probably that is going to help us this morning. Cleopas went on to explain how the women went, checked the tomb, it was empty, Peter went, see that Jesus was indeed not in the tomb. But on verse 26, Jesus starts now to answer the question. It was super interesting that when Jesus was answering this question, because he saw that clearly Cleopas was disappointed because the Messiah that he taught what he would do is not what Jesus did. He died and the Romans were still ruling them. In verse 27, it's so interesting that when Jesus starts addressing the concern of Cleopas, he didn't justify himself why the Romans were still in Jerusalem, why the Romans were still ruling, why Israel didn't overthrow them and were actually redeemed. He did something very interesting. He took him back to history. Verse 27 says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted the things, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scripture. Two things here. Most of the time when we say that God has failed us or has failed our expectation, it doesn't mean that God didn't come through. It's just he came Maybe he didn't address what we thought was a priority. Because clearly here we can see that Jesus came indeed. 
As we can see the way he described him as a mighty prophet of God, he believed that he was a prophet of God. It's just like the priority that Cleopas had was that he should set us free, he should set Israel free. How many times do we do that as well? That if God does not address what we have as a priority, he hasn't done anything else. So we are going to disregard everything else that he has done for us. So sometimes God will be like, you know, I know you are looking for a job, but look, I want you, I want to help you to deal with your anger issue or whatever caused you to lose the job so that if I give you another job, you won't lose it. The priority of a person may be uh, the job, but God is looking from a different perspective. It's like, I'm going to give it to you, no problem, but we've got to deal with something that can help you save what you're looking for. I hope we can be people and Christians who align with God's expectation so that we will not miss when he comes and when he's doing things in our lives and we have the impression that he has failed us. As I was saying, look at how Jesus addressed this concern. He took him back to history. I can imagine how the conversation went. So pretty much he took him and said, do you remember Moses? Do you remember the story of Passover? Do you remember the blood that the children of Israel had to apply on their doors? That was a prefiguration of my death, the blood that I gave on the cross. I can imagine him saying, do you remember when they were in the wilderness? Moses had to raise the serpent, and whoever looked at the serpent lived. The same way that serpent was raised in the wilderness, that's the same way. I was raised too for the whole world. I can go on and on and on and on and on and show how, how Jesus uh, was prefigured in the laws, in the prophets, and, 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 and so on. What does that mean to us? If you are like me, struggling to see if whether God failed you or God did not meet your expectations, God is asking you today and say, go and track my record. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. It's like, you feel disappointed? Let's go back in history and let's track my record. If you feel like God hasn't been fair to you or, you know, didn't meet the expectation that you had, you will, he would. What this story is telling us is saying, go and track back my record. You will see that I've been good to you. You will see that I've loved you. You will see that I've protected you. You will see that I've provided for you. You will see that when nobody else was there, I was there with you in a hard time. You will see that, 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 that pretty much the exercise that Jesus was trying to do with Cleopas. The exercise that I'm going to leave you this morning is, as we are starting this new week, just do this exercise. Don't ask for anything to God. Try as much as you can to thank God for what, for what he has done good to you. Spend time. Say thank you for my family. Thank you for I'm still standing. Thank you for my grandkid. Thank you because I've retired. I've worked, finished my work, and I can enjoy my retirement. Thank you because I can afford the house. Sometimes when we miss, we miss to see the work of God in our lives because we don't want to focus on what he's doing. And if you do that exercise, I'm pretty sure by the time we meet next Sunday, you will see that God has been good to you. He didn't fail you. He didn't fail your expectation. He was present, and he was dealing with probably something that was a priority to him that was not to you. May God bless his word. Amen.